Good morning, dear brethren, sisters. Church of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Get your authorized version of the scriptures. Please read along with me in the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Please. Because I make mistakes. Sometimes I read too fast. In reading too fast, sometimes I'll skip something. Also, my pronunciation <laughs> sometimes has a lot to be desired. And plus, see, you, you need to be active in what you are hearing, but also seeing it in Scripture. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. What is the Word of God? It is the authorized version. The perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration of God. The authorized version. So, be a Berean. The Bereans who first received the Word with all readiness, they wanted truth. And because they wanted truth, they search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. This video, we're going to encompass many things. Um, this is a video where we are going to be addressing something that a brother sent me. Um, and um, you'll see, you'll see. But we're going we're gonna to build up to that. We're going to provide for you first the truth. And then we're going to look at the subtle, subtle. We're also going to have a, a look at a word and the variations thereof, okay? Uh, so, so, please, get the scriptures. Read along with me. Brother, your, your question about the music, we will, we will get to that. You have not, not ignoring you. That's, um, it's a good question. And how to specifically, as far as specifically with... Christian rap? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, to answer that scripturally, that's going to take a little bit. of a little bit, But don't worry. We'll, we will get to that, Lord willing. But first, turn in your authorized version to Matthew 10. Matthew 10. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for a rebuke. Or for doctrine, for instead of, you know what, instead of butchering that, why don't we start out with that, huh? Yeah, why don't we start out with uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Scripture, you got to remember the Apocrypha is not scripture, Catholic. And is profitable for doctrine. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And also you can remember what it says in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, making reference unto the Old Testament that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Okay? You have these Christians, which is going to, the word is going to be attacked today, so you know, who will, you know, only pay attention to the New Testament and neglect the Old Testament. And for your knowledge, dear friend, before the death, burial, and resurrection, doctrinally, it was still the Old Testament because the law was still binding. Okay? Matthew 10, verses 5 on to verse 20. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Okay? 
At his first coming, Jesus was sent unto the Hebraic Jewish people. It's after the death, burial, and resurrection, the blood shed on the cross that brought in the New Testament, which has grafted us Gentiles into the tree of the Jew, making us accepted in the beloved. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. Salvation changes in the dispensation. Before the death, burial, and resurrection, the law was still binding. I abhorrently reject the notion that the three-year ministry was one of the seven dispensations. I, I vehemently reject that because um, the law was still binding because ultimately the sacrifice for sins, the perfect sacrifice for sins, has had yet to be made. Okay? Besides, you kind of run into some doctrinal problems with that, but we won't get into that. Anyway, as ye go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the physical, literal kingdom, which will be in Jerusalem. Not the kingdom of God. There is a distinction, a difference between the two. Yes, kingdom of God can be a reference onto the physical, literal kingdom, but that is defined by context. But the majority of the appearance of kingdom of God is usually a reference onto the spiritual aspect. And you got to remember, before the death, burial, and resurrection, what was their faith in? It was not in the death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, or else you would have a clear contradiction with Ephesians chapter 3, or else Peter would not have said the things that he said. Okay? All right, what was their faith in? Him as king. Okay? Not in the death, burial, and resurrection. All right? Before, the, before it happened, they didn't know about it. Watch out for these devils who tell you that they were looking forward to the cross before it happened. They weren't. Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely ye have received. Freely give. Okay? These disgusting free gracers, which we're not going to be attacking today, um, would come to this and try to tie in their, um, uh, uh, well, I, I forgot the term already, antinomianism. Okay, they try to tie that in there. Disgusting people, you free graces are. Okay? And remember, the Jews require a sign. Those are sign gifts. Okay? All right? The sign gifts that were in Acts were there as a sign for the Jews, but right here also it applies signs, okay? The Jews require a sign. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staff. For the workman is worthy of his meats. God will provide. The miracle of the loaves and the fishes. He said to the disciples, How is it that ye are without understanding? How is it you don't get this? See, as king of the physical, literal kingdom of heaven, the Lord can miraculously provide for his people as king. That's reference under that. Okay? And into whatso and this is for our instruction in righteousness here too. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. Worthy. Oh, we can go off in directions on that one. Worthy. Who does the who defines what is the worth? You or the scriptures? You are your own God. You are your own standard. Who decide, Who defines the worth? Hmm? And you got to be careful with that because you got people who you know like and likened on the Calvinists say, "Well, there was something worthy in me for God to die for me." No, no. What does that lead on to? Pride. Pride. We are not to be proudful, prideful. 
And when ye come into the an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So does this mean that we need to learn everything of the devil? No. What does it mean? Hmm? Does that mean that when we are in Rome that we are to be as the Romans? To do as the Romans? Hmm? Does that mean that in the spirit of forgiveness that you're going to realign yourself with the devil who is lost and going to hell and no matter what you do that serpent will always bite you sometimes brother <laughs> sometimes brother I see that and it's like I love you. What in her days are you doing? Anyway. 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 Let's continue. But beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the councils. And they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the capital S spirit of your Father which speaketh you. You got to remember, under the law, in the dispensation of the law, which before the death, burial, and resurrection it was. The Holy Ghost could come into someone, obviously. Yes, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that Spirit, could come into a believer under the law. Absolutely. However, the permanence thereof, as is today, because of the circumcision made without hands, was not there. Under the law, the Holy Ghost could come and go, come and go, come and go. Okay? All right? As opposed as to today, when you go the elect way of the cross, broken, contrite, and in fear of him, you call upon his name, he saves you, but seals you with himself until the day of redemption. Once saved, always saved. You're the heretic who denies eternal security. Or conditional, as they, they say. Whatever they say. So many words. Okay? you got to remember that. But, looking at verse 16. Be ye therefore wise as serpents. Coloss uh, Colossians. Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 2. 2 Corinthians, chapter 2. You know, I'm a little, I'm a little, um, got a little sorrow in the heart today. I do. Um, my dear brother, in thinking that doing the right thing and showing forgiveness, we ought to forgive people. Yes, we ought to. Is it a requirement for salvation? No, it is not. Anyone who's preaching that 
that you have to forgive in order for to be forgiven, that is a work. That is a work that will be there for the kingdom of heaven, which we are not in right now. Should you forgive others? Yes. Yes. Is it required of you for salvation? No. You do not have to forgive people. You should? Yes. Because it will affect your walk with the Lord. It will, ref uh, it will affect your fruit. And also it will reflect him. But remember this. That does not mean that once you forgive someone, dear, dear brother, that you open the door for a serpent who boots the door only to inevitably bite you again. What's wrong with you? What's wrong? I, I, I've, 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 I've seen this. You've seen this. You keep going back and that devil is laughing at you. Mark my words, brother. You're going to get bitten again. You keep allowing a door for that dog. And every single time you open it up sooner or later you are bitten again what's wrong with you dear brother I don't understand I don't understand I truly do not anyway enough of that 2nd Corinthians chapter 2 those people that are around you are not going to tell you that. Second Corinthians chapter 2. But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice having confidence in, in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. Now, he's talking about the dude in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, who is having a relation with his father's wife, disgusting. And the Corinthian saints got the guy out of there. They did. Praise the Lord. However, however, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly to, unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Now you got to remember this about the dude that was in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is strongly suggested especially when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that the individual was a saved man who got grossly messed up why to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus okay when you are of your father the devil that does not apply because you're already in the hands of the devil you're in his snare okay so the individual who was grotesquely having relations with his father's wife, disgusting, is greatly suggested unto us in scripture, I say proven, that he was actually a saint who just got totally messed up. Okay? Alright? Verse 6. Sufficient to such a man is the punishment which was inflicted of many. Okay? So contrarywise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Now in context to certain individuals who you forgive who are lost devils, 
who are serving the Vatican, who are going to go to hell and manipulate circumstances, put on a facade, speak smooth words, who debase you, and who have proven themselves over and over and over and over and over and over to be lost, untrustworthy, who will bite you eventually. Uh, this is not what this is talking about. This is in context to a saved brother. Lost people, forgive, forget, and go on. Don't be a dog returning to your vomit. That's not what's being talked about. This is in context with someone who is saved. Okay? All right? All right? Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. Lovest thou those who hate our Lord? Love is showing truth. Yes, and forgiveness, that is there. Brother, I love you. When you get bitten again, you deserve it. I'm sorry. I love you. I'll be here for you. But you're opening the door to that dog. And when that dog bites again, that serpent bites again, I can't pity you. You've done it to yourself when you ought to know better. For, this, for to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Catholics will take that and say that, you know, to twist it, that the Jesuit priest is another Christ. No, no, in the person of Christ, meaning for Christ's sake, okay? All right, as an example, okay? Especially amongst one who is a brother, okay? Now, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, and as we read in Matthew chapter 10, for we are not ignorant of his devices. His devices, his methods, things he employs. Like putting on a facade, feigned remorse, feigned repentance. Do you know that that man is making literal merchandise of you? <laughs> Further, now... Let's stop there, okay? Let's stop there. Can you show me in this context where the said individual was welcomed back into fellowship? Show it to me. Show it to me in this context. It's not there. Thus what happens between brethren. When a brother, uh, when the drastic action of a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, when someone has to, you know, hey, dude, you're in sin, you're not taking correction, okay, you, you want to go on, all right, I love you, get away from me, get away from us, okay? Until the Lord correct you in that and you receive correction, uh, we can't, you can't be around, you can't be around us or other people like that, you know, you can't. Okay, get out of here. We are told in this example to forgive him. Because obviously there was repentance on his part. Prove it. So that contrarywise, he ought rather to forgive him and comfort him. Lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Sorrow for the deed and sorrow for being put away. Okay. However, in that forgiveness, find it for me. Please, where it is even implied that he is brought back into fellowship. It is not. 
Because once that action is taken, that is something that is to be marked. Forgiveness is there between brethren. We have the same Father. Amen, amen, amen. It is not a requirement for salvation, but it is the better to do so, yes. But then usually what, what happens is because that mark was there and there is forgiveness, that pristine fellowship that once was there will not be pristine again between man. Why? Because of flesh. The sagging sin suit. Do you understand? And especially with someone who is not of the church of God, forgive, forget, but you keep opening that door for that dog. <laughs> I'm beloved, you, you deserve what you get. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get bitten. You're going to be mocked. Okay, that man, that dog, is not a saved man. Stop treating him like he is. But that's, that's you. That's you. All right, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us, saved people, to triumph in Christ, and make manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death. Lost people. Lost people. The wages of sin is death. And the saint makes the lost person aware either by you know, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But when they don't want to hear the word of God, the behavior, the conversation of the saint as an ambassador for Christ. Keep that in mind when you are allowing yourself to have fellowship with people you shouldn't. And to the other, we are the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? Verse 17. And we're going to see this in the link that we're going to be looking at today. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Well, the Greek says. The, the Greek rendering, it could be. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ as if God did beseech you by us, his body. Okay? So to be as wise as serpents is basically what? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Doesn't mean that we condescend to be like sinners, okay? Doesn't mean that when we are in Rome, we do as the Romans do. It doesn't mean to be like the world, to win the world, God forbid. Uh, the world has enough of itself. It needs something that is contrary to the world. Okay? That's not what it means. We, sh we, can't be, we need to be aware of the devil's rhetoric, the devil's schemes, his, their operations that they employ, their methods. Their, their phraseology, their words, their wording. Like in Monday's video, we saw about how the antinomianist puts faith before grace. They, I, look at Monday's video, the link, for, well, it'll be in the description box for you, okay? 
All right? Now, we are going to be looking, we're going to look at this last. But we're going to be looking at several things today. First of all, the word Christian. Now, we have talked about this before. Christian. Christian. Actually, uh, no, no, let's go through this first. The word Christian appears three times in Scripture. All right? Now, Christ means anointed. Are we a little anointed ones? Well, according to the heretic, with his subtle, oh, smooth, Smooth as glass, slicker than snot. Mr. Fig, smooth. That man's smooth, boy. Oh, he's smooth. Okay? Smooth, subtle. All right? We're going to see this. The term Christian appears three times in Scripture. Acts 11, verse 26 now, this is very important. Uh, when you utilize first mention, okay, it's very important. Now, there are saints out there who unfortunately still refer to themselves as Christian. Okay? Is the, if you're a saint and you want to refer to yourself as a Christian, a worldly term, um, is that a salvific issue? No. No. No, it is not. But see, what it is today is you're linking yourself up with something when most people, and we are to be ambassadors for Christ, not to be conformed to this world, and Christian is a world term. Um, when you associate yourself with that, when you're trying to be a witness unto the lost, and then you got antinomianists who call themselves Christians who give this example of their little G God, okay? You already start off on the wrong foot, okay? Mention the term Christian to a Hebraic Jew. What do they think of the, the Crusaders with the crosses on their tunics? Why do you think most Hebraic Jews who are saved want to be referred to as Messianic Jews rather than Christian. Is it a, salva a salvation issue? No. No. No, it isn't. You're not going to go to hell because you're referring to yourself as a Christian. Okay? As a saint. Because nowadays there are so many out there who call themselves Christians and all they are are representatives of their father, the devil. Look at the antinomians, the free gracers. I rest my case. Verse 26 in Acts 11. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, the body, not a building, and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Who called them that? Hmm? Paul refers to us as saints. The Lord himself never referred to us as such. Never. It came first appearance. The disciples were called. And then uh, Mr. Fig did is like, well, why were they being called that? Okay, turn that right back on you. Why are they called that today? Oh, because they believe in Jesus. <laughs> okay. Which one? The Jesus of uh, Rome, which is that man of sin, the son of perdition, Satan. That's the Jesus of Rome. You know, of a three-person trinity. Yeah, buddy. Hmm? How about the Jesus of the Pentecostal faith? Hmm? Who appears to people, especially in Australia. Hmm. What about, is that the Jesus you're talking about? Hmm? 
What about the Jesus of the antinomian? Hmm? Who doesn't require any adherence to any law whatsoever. Especially the morality of the law, which we addressed in Monday's video. Hmm? Is that the Jesus you're talking about? Huh? So, Christian. Little Christ, huh? So does God, the Lord Jesus, expect you to be something that you cannot be? Sinless and perfect? Perfect in heart, yes. Hmm? First mention. It's a worldly term. Hmm. And I personally believe that during the time of Jacob's trouble, that that man of sin, the son of perdition, who's going to have, I believe, the visage, face, of the Roman Catholic Jesus is going to refer to all of you who will follow him during the time of Jacob's trouble as Christians, little Christs. Hmm? It's a worldly term. Acts chapter 26, 24 and 32. Saying, fear not. Uh, I'm in Acts 27. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad. Remember, mad is talking about insanity, not anger. Most noble, Fe I am not mad, most noble Festus. But speak forth the words of truth and sober. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in the corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Verse 28. Now, before we read verse 28, I want you to consider some things. Paul was aware of the term. How could he not be? Especially when he was in Rome. He wrote the Epistle of Rome, apparently. Uh, Epistle of Rome. Uh, he wrote the epistles, the pastoral epistles from Rome. Okay, Paul died in Rome. Okay, he did not die in Jerusalem. Okay, Paul was aware of the term. If this term was acceptable to the Lord and most people like, Brad you're making a big deal of it have you how long, when you talk to people in witnessing uh, do you how much time do you have to spend in order to justify a term to separate you from other Christians how long does it take you hmm how long does it take you to affirm the individual that uh, you're witnessing onto? Well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm not like those other Christians. How so? Well, these Christians, they say this and they do, do, do this. Do that. It's pointless. Let it go. Let it go. Save yourself the trouble. Let it go. But, Okay? Paul was aware of the term. Why didn't he use it? Who wrote the book of Acts? It is greatly regarded that Luke wrote the book of Acts. Told in the very first chapters. Why didn't Paul use it? Why did he have this nagging thing to call us saints? In Church of God. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then Agrippa, verse 28, said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now there are those out there who will bring up the 
argument of, well, Paul didn't say anything about it. He didn't rebuke him. No, he didn't. But you know what Paul did? He didn't even acknowledge it. Prove it to you. Absolutely. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. People will say, well, see, Paul uh, was okay with the term Christian. I beg to differ. I believe it is an example of, for example, just passing over it, not giving it any credence. Okay? You can make whatever argument you want with this, with verse 29. I know the, the one who's trying to defend himself that he's saved and he isn't was all up in arms about verse 28 and 29. Paul wasn't against it. Paul uh, affirmed it. No, he didn't. No, he, he didn't. He affirmed of himself that he was a follower of Christ, not a Christian. Okay? He didn't even give it credence. He didn't. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. Witness, testimony. Not a little Christ. I beg to differ. I believe that Paul just ignored it. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I wish people were... Because Paul's like, he has said several times in the Apolline epistles, twice, be followers of me. Not that he wanted to start his own denomination like King James Bible believing Christianity. Okay? No, Paul was the example of how the saint is to follow Christ in this dispensation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Greek is a Gentile. But Paul is the apostle of the, on to the Gentiles. But you read the book of Acts, he went to the Jew first. Okay? He didn't even give it a second thought. Okay? And like it says, uh, hold your place, because we're going to finish that and what it says. Like he says in Galatians chapter 2, gave subjection to them, no, not for even an hour. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Galatians 2. Come on, fingers. Galatians 2. Uh, <laughs> verses 4 and 5. And because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subje a subjection? No! Not for an hour. Didn't even pay to mind that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Verse 6. But of those who seem to be somewhat Christian, Whosoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God ex accepteth no man's person. For they whom seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. And then Paul affirms, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, and the gospel to, of the circumcision was unto Peter, okay, Paul, dear friend, in verse 28, you like to cling to that a little bit. But there again, I believe Paul disregarded it. Because, okay, a Christian, oh, that's a snappy, that's catchy, let's call it. Why was it never mentioned by Paul? Hmm? He was aware of the term, why didn't he use it? First mention. It's a worldly term fixed to people from the world. Okay? Oh, and oh, 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 1 Peter chapter 4. Here, here's the one that all of you 
who cling to this with a death grip like. Okay? You're ignoring certain things about this context. We're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 11 on to verse 19. Okay? Listen, saint. You want to call yourself a Christian? That's your problem. Well, you, you know, comparing yourself among yourselves. Okay? Be like the world to win the world. Have you not figured it out that Christianity is nothing but worldliness? You haven't, had you? But you still want to, let's, let's, let's make Christian great again, huh? Through King James Bible believing Christianity, right? <laughs> yeah. First yeah. Peter 4, 11 to the close. Now, keep this in mind. Keep these things in mind as we're reading this. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If you're going to speak, go as the Lord would guide you through his word. Okay, we've read, we've talked about this. You can read in Ezekiel and stuff like that in one of the videos we have about, you know, we speak his word. His words. The authorized version. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. Our door is always open to the saints. Okay? Ministering. As the ability God giveth. I, because of my health problems, cannot physically engage in physical work. I can't. I die. I die. Okay? I die. But ministering, ministering, being available to the saints, having the door open to a saint, whoever they may be, whenever they may need to be in fellowship with saints, fellow saints. Our door is always open to the saint. Always. What about you, hot shot? I said hot shot, by the way. Okay? If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. See, when Christians are of the world, speaking of worldly things and the world heareth them and we saints are speaking from the scriptures warning people being examples unto the lost by how if they don't want to hear the word by our conversation by our behavior again you look at the antinomiasts or however you pronounce it i don't care the free gracers here on youtube yeah yeah See, Christians convey to you, don't worry about it, the antinomian thing. You're not bound by any moral uh, obligation to any law except the law of Christ. Well, what is the law of Christ? Hmm? What is the law of Christ? We, we answer that in uh, Monday's video. Okay? That will be in the description box for you. Beloved! Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. <laughs> this is a saint, dude. Haven't you, haven't you figured this out already? Well, you saints have. You're, you're a saint. And you're around these Christians. And you're a legalist. You're too extreme. You're, doing, you're talking about things that God doesn't talk about. Oh, so the scripture's insufficient, huh? You're too extreme. Dream, you're too serious. You're you got standards that God doesn't have. You ever run into that one? And where do you get that from? The Christian. It's like, but, but, oh, oh, you know, align our lives according to Scripture. Yea, hath God said, "What is the Scripture?" Your NIV Bible. See how that works. See how that bleeds into that, huh? Then they go to the the Greek. 
I have no respect for any man or woman go who brings up the Greek. None. I have no respect for you. You are an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are an enemy of his word, the authorized version, the perfect and errant, given by inspiration word of God. You are an enemy of God, and I have no respect for you. you go to the Greek. Yeah. So, you, saint, adhere to a perfect standard. The Christian, hey, it's whatever makes you feel good. The Greek, the Greek, huh? You're too extreme. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. See, the Christ of the authorized version of the scriptures was not this pliable teddy bear who has no requirements, who is not angry, okay? Who doesn't want you not to judge, okay? That is satanic. The Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ of Scripture, was very confronting. You read Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. Okay? He was not a good looking guy, number one. And to the Pharisee, the Sadducee, the scribe, the, you know, the elites, no one wanted to hear what he had to say except the common folk, the po people, the publicans and sinners. But see, the established religionists, the Christians, you could say. Didn't want to hear it. You've been taught a false Jesus. So when we, the saint, adhering our lives to the scriptures, rightly divided, it's a fiery trial. And any one of you saints that have done anything for our Father out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Christians, uh, what is it? Uh, what, uh, whatever lies in you may be at peace. You call it compromise. We do not compromise. As much as lieth in you, live be at peace with all men. Okay, peace with all men. Example, get away from them. What fellowship has light with darkness? Okay? You know, if, you know, Christianity wants you to compromise. Saints don't compromise. And when we do, we get into all kinds of trouble. Our walk gets messed up. Our testimony gets messed up. Then the Lord brings on painful chastening, which yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness that the saint can see. Okay? But rejoice, verse 13, and as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ. Look at, don't look at me. Look at that. Look at that. Look at it. What's the name, who, what's the name of Christ? Christ means anointed one. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Messiah, saying uh, there are differences, but, okay, Christ is anointed one. You don't need to go to the Greek to find that. It's in Luke chapter 2 somewhere, and the Lord's anointed, okay, Christ. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, Look at, look at that. What's the name of Christ? Your name? Little Christ? No, Jesus. Jehovah saves. So, Christian, be reproached for the name of Christ as a Christian. What's Christ's name? <laughs> Whose name, right? 
whose name? Yahasha, Yahawasha, Hushiwachi, uh, Kawasaki, or whatever? Yeah, hath God said? How do you, have you taken the time and looked at this before? If you be reproached for the name of Christ, Jesus, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief. Hold your place. John 10. John 10. Verses, oh, well, let's read verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, saying, boot the door, the same as a thief and a robber, skipping down. Skip down to verse 8, on to verse 10. All that ever came, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in body of Christ, and out, redemption of the purchased possession, making a reference unto it, and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Mm. Verse 15 in 1 Peter 4 But let none of you suffer as a murderer. A thief cometh to what? A thief cometh to what? Steal and to kill and to destroy. To climb up some other way. Antinomianist. Catholic. Pentecostal. And the list goes on and on and on. Christian. Okay? But let none of you suffer as a murderer. Or as a thief. Or as an evildoer. Or as a busybody in other men's matters. Oh, you see that uh, exemplified with these antinomianists. Oh, like the Athenians who live to only to hear or talk about gossip, as it were, of some new thing. And they all jump on a bandwagon. Verse 16, okay? Now look at the context. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but rather but let him glorify God on this behalf. What does this mean? You got Christians out there today giving you the example of their father, the devil. Compromise, lukewarmness, hatred of truth, denial of what is pure, God's word. Not rightly dividing the word of truth. Love is love, and so on, and so on. Justifying profanity. Believe and receive. But yet, the world's going to mark you as this, but you are going to what? Suffer as, okay, being the actual thing that they claim to be, yet not ascribing to it. Does that make sense to you? In context, okay, it's better to, as a saint, to die, suffer as a Christian, rather than what? A murderer, or as a thief. Be the real thing, 
that they claim to be, but all the while not taking upon yourself a worldly term. Uh, why didn't Peter use it then? He uses it right here in this context as a reference as to what it's better to die as, with that worldly uh, term rather than what? A murderer or as a thief. Dear friend, Peter is not justifying you affixing yourself to that label. But if you're going to die as such, or suffer as such, when most all of them otherwise, okay, see how that works? But there again, this is the only time Peter mentions it. And in context, in context, it's a worldly term. And Paul was aware of the term. Peter obviously was aware of the term. But they never called themselves that. We never. It's a worldly term affixed onto us. And remember, you people who get left behind, that man of sin who's going to look like your Jesus is going to call you Christian. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. We are of God's house. Why didn't he say that judgments must begin amongst us Christians. Why didn't he say it, uh, use it again? Making a distinction between a worldly term and the thing that is, dear friend. And if it first begin at us, what shall, shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Christian is a worldly term affixed unto the saints by the world. And in the context of 1 Peter, it is comparable as the lesser of the evil of a thief and a murderer and a busybody. But see, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Just, we're just going to read that one verse. Just going to read that one verse. Subtle. Subtle. It's spelled subtle, but we pronounce it subtle. Go figure. But see, the devil, Satan, He's a smooth talker, boy. Dragon! Speak like a dragon. How many times have we got to go over this? A dragon speaks smoothly, softly, could lull you into a trance-like state with their monotone voice, smoothly lulling you to sleep as if speaking to you a lullaby. That's how a dragon speaks, boy. See, saints are supposed to be salt, which preserves and burns. Now the serpent was more subtle. We pronounce it subtle. We do. We do. But there it's subtle. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? Subtle. 
smoothly. He didn't come in with guns a blazing and fireworks because that would be obvious. Like that one bald headed idiot from England. Over the top. You know, love Satan and forgive Satan, but he can get away with that because people are not hearing the words of the Lord. We've talked about that at length. Smooth. Rat poison is 95% good food. It's that 5% that kills you. The little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Subtle. Graft just came in kind of smooth, man. You know? Yeah, uh, come here. D did he really say that? Did he really mean that? Second Samuel. We're going to look at all the variations of, there is only 12 of them. Or 12 verses. Uh, so we're going to look at this. We're going to look at this. Out of order, but according to word. The very first appearance of any variation of the word subtle. Subtle. Yea, hath God said, but remember, we are to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Okay? 2 Samuel, chapter 13. 2 Samuel, chapter 13. 2 Samuel, chapter 13. Verses 1, <laughs> let's read on to verse 5. Yea, hath God said, subtle, subtle, whatever. We pronounce it subtle. I'm not going to get hinged on that during the making of this. If I'm doing it wrong, okay, for now we're just going to go with it, okay? And it came to pass after this that Absalom, Absalom, excuse me, the son of David had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Oh, what a coincidence! The second appearance of the singular subtle is in context with Tamar and Ammon! Half brother and sister. Hmm. And Ammon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. He, he wanted to have physical relations. He wanted to lay with his half-sister. Makes you want to gag, doesn't it? Yeah. But Amman, Amnon, excuse me, had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle, subtle man. Hmm, smooth. Prove it to you. Absolutely. Subtle. Crafty. Sly. Artful. We are going to look in the Webster's, but we see, we're doing it first in Scripture, then we're going to go to uh, Mr. Webster. And he said unto him, Why art thou being the king's son? Hey! You're, you're one of the king's son. What's your problem, dude? Live it up! You have got some? And he said unto them, Why art thou being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? Nama Amon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Love, huh? Yeah. If you were to continue reading this entire um, account, after Amon raped his half-sister and did what he did, his love, which was actually lust, immediately turned to hatred. Hence, a lot of the love that you are being told about or being prescribed to by Christianity is exactly this. Lust, not true love. And Jonadab said unto him, Subtle, you have got said. 
大，你看他看大，等会儿吧，等会儿吧。Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick, feigning himself to be something that he wasn't, putting on a facade. Hmm. Ha ha. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress meat in my sight, that I may see it, and eat it at her hand. So come up with a false ploy to lull her to you. Subtle. Very interesting, huh? Now the third appearance of subtle. You're going to like this. Proverbs 7, dude. Yeah. Okay. Are you, are you catching that one, brother? Sister, huh? You, uh, whoever you are, Christian? Christian? Proverbs 7. Verses. Oh, let's read. Verses 1 on the first time. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law is the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Bind them upon thy fingers. Yea, we got, we got the scriptures in our hands, don't we? Write them upon the table of thine heart. Commit it from here to here. Search the scriptures daily. What are these things to be so? Say unto wisdom the fear of the Lord. Thou art my sister, and call understanding departing from evil. Thy kinswoman. When Christianity is nothing but the opposite. The antinomian. No fear of the Lord. You're not under any moral obligation of any law, but to what you decide. We've talked about that. That they may keep thee from the strange one. From the stranger which flattereth with her words. God loves you. Just believe and receive. Go to, you need to go to the church. You need to go home to the church Christ founded. Which one? The name of Christ. What's the name of Christ? For at the window of my house, I look through my casement. This, he's in his house looking out, seeing what's going on. I beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths, supposed to grow up. A young man void of understanding, departing from evil. Doesn't depart from evil. He's out there putting himself in a position to get bitten again. Passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house. Her house. One over there, one over there, one over there. No, there's that, that there's that other one over there with the phallus on it. Hey, uh, brethren, sistren, you went out that way, you saw that one church building I was talking about with the phallus on it. Yeah, you saw it. One over there, you got the Romans over there. In the twilight. In the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Oh, yeah. She loved bombs him. Hey, hey, look at me. I'm righteous. I, I totally believe without a doubt 
that Proverbs 7 is a reference on to Mystery of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, all Roman Catholicism, Rome, your enemy, and the mother of abominations, the mother of harlots, antinomianism. Just an example, Calvinism. And whatever ism you want to, Ruckmanism, whatever you want to put in there. Mm. So, subtle, three appearance of the singular form thereof. Not looking good. Not looking good. Now, subtlety, subtlety, subtle, th there's a difference here. Subtlety, Genesis 27, go back to Genesis 27. Genesis 27, okay? Like I said, pronunciation, I'll be corrected on it, okay? Uh, for this, uh, and I'm not using a set of scriptures that has a pronunciation key. Um, there's no real pronunciation key, I think, for the word subtle in script. I, I may be wrong. I'll find out later. <laughs> I, I will, okay? But uh, Genesis 27. Genesis 27. Oh, let's read verses 34 on to, oh, 38. Genesis 27. The context. Now subtle. Okay? The three appearances that we saw so far. Okay? We see what? Smoothness. Deceptiveness. Okay? The smoothness. Okay? And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. This is talking about Esau, who sold his birthright to Jacob, because his God was his belly for a bowl of soup and bread and water or whatever it was he gave him to drink. Because he, what good was this birthright going to be unto me? I'm at the point of death. And then Jacob, you know, supplanter, or he who takes his brother by the heel, more uh, scripturally accurate, okay? Um, <laughs> it's like, hey, I'll give you some food, some of your birthright. And Esau's God was his belly. He done blew it. And there's a reference here for Hebrews 12. You go ahead and check that out on your own time. And he said, Thy brother, this is Isaac talking, came with subtlety, subtlety, and hath taken away thy blessing using a deceptive thing because he, he put the uh, animal skin on his neck or something like that or on his hands um, and but his voice was his own voice and Isaac couldn't see and he felt Jacob and he's like oh the body feels like Esau but the voice is Jacob's and very interesting about this whole thing um, uh, Isaac asked Jacob you know you, you brought this to me the venison really quick how is it you got it so quickly? Jacob responded, The Lord thy God brought it to me. Because I had often wondered about this whole scenario. How could Isaac have been, was Jacob that good at his deception? Or was there, or was it, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated, hated from the, the God who can see the beginning from the end? How could Isaac fall for something. Even though he was blind, he could feel, okay, this feels like Esau, but that's, that's Jacob's voice. What's going on here? The Lord thy God brought it to me. Because Esau he hated. God hated Esau. Because Esau sold his birthright for soap. Let's continue. And he said, is not he, is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me, 
These two times there we get supplanted, taken his brother by the heel. Okay? He hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. Yes, he did, but it wasn't at gunpoint. Okay? Jacob's like, hey, give me your birthright. And I'll give you, I'll give you, I won't even just give you soup, but I'll give you bread and something to drink along with it. He gave him more than he asked for. You can read this on your own time. Very fascinating study. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And the blessing was tied into the birthright. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto him, Esau, Behold, I have made him thy lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto him, unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And then you read on that Esau's blessing was to come from purely, purely the earth because his God was his belly. This is why God hated Esau. Because Esau's God was flesh, his belly. Let, let that roll around in your head for those of you who are trying to love your enemies in the wrong way. You show love to your enemies by exhibiting truth, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. They are rebellious. That's how you love your enemies. This love that most Christians are doing to those who are their enemies is wicked. Keep that in mind there, okay? Roll that up in your pipe and smoke it, huh? All right, now go to 2 Kings chapter 10. 2 Kings chapter 10. 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 19 is the actual verse. We're going we're gonna to get a little context, okay? 2 Kings chapter 10. Oh, Jehu! All right? <laughs> Jehu! 2 Kings chapter, oh, excuse me. <laughs> yes, chapter 10, verse 19. Verses 13. Uh, let's read verses uh, 15. On to, uh, oh, let's read to verse 20. In 2 Kings chapter 10. Jehu. He, uh, he kills um, Jezebel, who painted her face. Then she was cast out the window by some eunuchs, and then the horses stamped on her to death. This is Jehu. Verse 15 on to verse 20. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rachab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right, as my heart is with thee, thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand. And he took him up to him into the chariot. And he said, This is Jehu speaking, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. And when he came out, zeal for the Lord. And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord which he spake to Elijah. I guess Jehu wasn't showing that much love, huh? Hmm. And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal. Baal. This one doesn't have the pronunciation key. It's a two syllable. Baal. Or Baal. Okay. Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. Now therefore, call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants and all his priests. Let none be wanting, for I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. <laughs> he sure did. Yeah. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. 
But Jehu did it in subtlety to the intent that he might destroy the worshipers of Baal. Now, and Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. Now, we see that uh, in verse 16, Jehu at least had at this time zeal for the Lord. Amen, amen. But he called all these guys together in subtlety. Why? To give an offering unto Baal, the death of all his followers. So, Jehu was acting with subtlety. Okay? But he himself wasn't subtle in that regard. Do you see? Ooh, do you see? Okay? Proverbs chapter 1. Oh, yeah. Because right here, right here, you're going to see. Okay? To be subtle scripturally is not good. But to behave in a subtle manner and with subtlety. Hmm. Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1. This one's starting to get broken. Verses 1 on to verse. Now notice, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, fear of the Lord and departing from evil, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity, the instruction how to fear the Lord, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Okay? Now, our first appearances of subtlety, of subtlety, okay? Jacob did it with the thing of the thing on his neck and his hairy hands, but the voice of his own did it with subtlety. But yet, and, but yet at that time, remember, Jacob himself was, <laughs> okay? But then we saw in 2 Kings chapter 10, Jehu, who himself, at least at that time, was not subtle, but behaved in that manner. Why? Out of zeal for the Lord. Same principle here. Let's continue. A wise man, one who fears the Lord, will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. You can liken this unto a homeless individual. You buy them a meal, and then you sit with them as you are eating a meal with a homeless man, instead of just randomly giving them money. Okay? All right? Instead of randomly doing that. Uh, take them with you. Use that opportunity in subtlety to witness. Not being deceptive in and of itself, but you're using that situation to another extent to be a witness unto the Lord. See? See? A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, words of the wise and their dark sayings, and dark sayings will be in the description box for you. Uh, we talk about that. What are dark sayings? Okay. All right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. There is a knowledge that comes from another wisdom that is earthly, sensual, devilish. Okay. But fools who say in their heart there is no God despise wisdom, the fear of the Lord, and instruction. Hmm. Hmm. Now, Matthew 26. Matthew 26. 
Matthew 26. Verse, well, the verse is verse 4, but we will read on to verse 5. Matthew 26, verses 1 on to verse 5. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people, unto the place of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Also another example of this is Rahab, with the spies that came in, and she hit them on the roof, and the people came in, it's like, hey, where are the, the spies of Israel? They came to search out the land. And what did Rahab do? It's like that they, they, they went they went that away. Go get them. All the while they were on the roof. Okay? Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And I've... I've I've uh, I actually used this once to um, to mention about a dog. All right, <laughs> all right. Verses six on to verse ten in Acts chapter thirteen. And notice how many times this subtlety appears. Six times. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. And when they had gone through the isle of unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar, son of Jesus. Or excuse me, Ben, Jesus, excuse me, whatever, whatever, not important. Bar Jesus, which was the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Eliamus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. A saint will be used of the Lord to plant a seed in someone who is seeking. Then along comes the devil and his ministers of righteousness. Like the antinomian. Oh, you don't worry about repenting. That's a work. Don't worry about calling upon the name of the word. Oh, Lord, that's a work. Okay? You just have to believe and receive. See? But Elim is the sorcerer. For so, it is his, for so is his name by interpretation. Withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, a mischievous person, mischievous, mischievous, okay, mischievous. I, I, I forget sometimes. Mischievous. Not mischievous. Mischievous. Okay? I gotta write that down because uh, we talk about that in one of the videos. Okay? Whatever. All right. Mischievous. And said, Oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? So we see out of the six thus far that the usage of this varies. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. This is the one that some of you were probably thinking of right away. 2 Corinthians 11. 
we will read verses 1 <laughs> on to verse oh, 4 now let's read on to verse 5 would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me you well, yeah because then you read in uh, chapter 10, okay, <clears throat> where it says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, verse 12, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Hmm. For I am jealous, of, uh, in chapter 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So we see, and, and that's the final appearance, of this and only two appearances after the death burial and resurrection and both appearances in this dispensation are not favorable out of the six two of them have a connotation such as we saw in Proverbs and also Jehu okay in Kings now what was that in 2 Kings and in Proverbs chapter 1. And see, in Proverbs chapter 1, to give subtlety to the simple, making them aware of it, not being ignorant of it. Okay? Being as wise as serpents. In order to spot the false, you first need to know what is the way, the truth, and the life. So in Proverbs, okay, hold your place because, well, well, let's finish this out. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, the antinomian Jesus, who's not angry, who doesn't judge, who has no requirements except you save yourself by your own belief, the Jesus of Rome, the Trinitarian, the one in the middle, the one of the Pentecostals, huh? Another Jesus, whom we have not preached, the saint, not a Christian. Or if ye have received another spirit, which ye have not received, note the lowercase s on that, or another gospel, the free grace gospel is not the gospel which ye have not accepted ye might well bear with him yeah because you're wise and we are despised you're honorable yeah yeah because uh, you, you know you're good enough you can you can be horish and involve and let everyone come in and hear all these arguments huh for I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest Apostles. Hmm. And remember, Paul referred to himself as nothing. Go back to Proverbs chapter 1. Okay? So in reality, dear saint, dear brother, dear sister, when it comes to this thing about subtlety, there is actually only one incident in Scripture with subtle subtlety, okay, where it is in use of a positive connotation and even that it was the butchering of the house of Ahab a form of judgment by Jehu but look at Proverbs 1 verse 4 to give subtlety to the simple to the young man knowledge and discretion we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices we are to be wise as serpents and harmless as, as doves we are not to be ignorant of how Satan operates. That's why 
You need to search the scriptures daily whether these things be so. This is why you need to study this. You need yourself approved unto God to be a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is why you're in the scriptures. It is life unto us, but it also shows you what is false because this is true. Subtly. Now, there was subtlety and subtly. Subtlety, subtlety, and subtly. Okay? I that. I'm pronouncing them wrong, I'm sure. But uh, first Samuel. This one is S-U-B-T-I-L-L-Y. We just finished up S-U-B-T-I-L-T-Y. And subtle with an I. Okay? Go to first Samuel. 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23. Okay? 1 Samuel 23. Oh, um. <laughs> Let's read, oh. This is during when David was hiding from Saul. Let's read verses 19 on to um, 24. It's 1 Samuel 23. So only three appearances of this. Then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Gebeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the wood, in the hill of Hakaliah, which is on the south of Jeshimon? Now therefore, O king, talking about King Saul, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down. And on and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord, for ye have compassion on me. Go, I pray you, prepare yet, and know, and see his place where his haunt is. And who has seen him there? For it is told me that he dealeth very subtly, subtly. He scratched on the doorpost and let the spittle fall down by his beard. Okay, when he was in the one thing, David messed up and went to the uh, Philistines. Okay, and stuff like that. Let's continue. See therefore and take knowledge of all his lurking places. And incidentally... Who referred to David as dealing very subtly? Saul? Yeah. David's enemy. See therefore and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself. And come ye again to me with the certainty. And I will go with you. And it shall come to pass, if he be in the land, that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshmon. Psalm 105. Again, with the only, what you're going to see, that when it comes to this thing of being subtle, and with all the variations thereof, thus far with only one bleak exception, not very well spoken of in scripture in any variation is it is it Psalm 105 Psalm 105 ah uh. oh let's read verses 15 on to verse 25 saying Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. There we, there's an older two-part video where we address this. The uh, Pentecostal Charismatics really like this one. So I'll put it in the description box. <laughs> and of course, little Christs. <laughs> okay. Imitate Christ who is sinless. Let's continue. Okay. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He break the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before him, even Joseph, 
who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance, to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his senators wisdom. Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. And he increased his people greatly, and made them stronger than their enemies. He turned their heart to hate his people. Because he did that because they believed in Pharaoh. They already made their choice that they were against the God who is. To deal subtly with his servants. Hmm. Hmm. Talking about the Exodus. Hmm. The Egyptians dealing subtly with the people of God turned their hearts because they had already chosen to believe in Pharaoh. There were some that did believe in the Lord when went through the judgments, yes, but the Egyptians, the type of the world, are after Satan, Pharaoh. Hmm. And lastly, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. <laughs> Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Oh. Uh, verses 15 on to verse 19. Recounting what we just read. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem. And laid in the sepulchre that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred. We just read this, basically a recounting of it in Psalm 105. Okay? Check your margin, there might even be a reference for it. The same dealt solely with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. So, subtly, subtle, subtlety, with one bleak appearance in Scripture, and any, and even that, with Jehu and Ahab, it's a form of judgment. It's not good. It's not good. It's not good. Now, uh, from Webster's 1828 Dictionary, what does Mr. Webster have to say? See, now this, is, when it comes to understanding a word in Scripture, this is how I recommend, I suggest, I hope you saint do it. Okay? Start here and then come here. Start here. Start with scripture. Subtle. From subtle, el subtilis, literally, su, whatever. This word is often written subtle with, and he spells it here. S-U-B-T-L-E, but less properly. Number one, thin, not dense or gross, as subtle air, subtle vapor, a subtle medium. Two, nice, fine, delicate. Hmm, yeah, I've got it. I do distinguish plain each subtle line of her of her immortal face, Davies. Acute, piercing as subtle pain. Sly, artful. <laughs> the art of deception. 
<laughs> Cunning, crafty, insinuating as a subtle person from Blackpool, a subtle adversary. Hmm. Yea, hath God said. <laughs> Planned by art. Ooh. Deceitful, mastering the art of deception. Jesuit coadjutors, infiltrators. As a subtle scheme. Deceitful, treacherous. Refined, fine, acute. As a subtle argument. Yeah, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Oh, no, he did. Ye shall not surely die. Subtly. S-U-B-T-I-L-L-Y, which appears three times in Scripture. Subtle appears three times in Scripture. Put those together, six. Don't miss that. Adverb, thinly, not densely. Two, finely, not grossly or thick. The opaquest bodies, if subtly divided, become perfectly transparent. Newton, artful, cunningly, crafty, as a scheme subtly contrived. Subtlety, S-U-B-T-I-L-T-Y, which appears six times in scripture. Number of man. Thinness, Fineness, exulty, e x i l i t y, in a physical sense, as the subtlety of air or light, the subtlety of sounds, bacon grew. Refinement, extreme acuteness, intelligible discourses are spoiled by too much subtlety in nice divisions. Yeah, as God said. <laughs> Three, slyness in design. Ooh, and wouldn't it be, and he doesn't put a reference for it, S-U-B-T-I-L-T-Y, and in 2 Kings 10, we see the only appearance like that in that context of Jehu killing the prophets of Baal, huh? Slyness and design, cunning, artifice, usually but less properly written, subtlety with an E. Hmm. Interesting, yes, no? <laughs> now, now we've gone through that. <laughs> now, I want to show you this. I want to show you this. We've, we've covered the things... First, the link for this, if you wish, will be in the description box. This is what a brother sent me. And this is so smooth. So smooth. This dude here. This, this dude, man. This dude. Uh, this is one of these things... Where if you um, if you don't if you're not paying attention, it'll slip right by you. Okay. All right. Here we go. Just what do you mean, Christian? And here's this this putz. He's got a Thompson chain reference. I got one of them, but this guy obviously does not use the scripture. And you're gonna see this. Check this out. This month of Southside leading, this month at Southside leading up to Estarte Sunday in April, we are doing a series entitled Christian. After all, the word Christian is, is the word used worldwide for people who are followers of Christ. Which Christ? I believe it is so important today to know who Jesus wanted us to be 
before we celebrate the event that gave us the privilege of being who we are today. And you're going to see little Christ. Um, in John chapter, what is it, 15? John chapter 15. Okay. This guy, this guy would make Mr. Fig proud. This guy is smooth as snap, boy. Okay. Little Christ, huh? You'll see this. John 15, verses 1, under verse 4. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Except ye abide, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye abide. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Verse five: I am the vine; ye are the branches. Ye are not gods. Ye are not gods. This guy, this puke, subtly suggests and condones the. Ye are God's doctrine. You'll see it. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Let's continue. In our current culture, the word Christian is used in both positive and negative ways. It's, it's negative. The only positive connotation is it's better to suffer like that than being a murderer. Or a thief to the eyes of the world. The first century followers of Jesus more than often received the negative. They were often persecuted or killed. So today I want to ask you what comes to your mind when you hear the word Christian? What ideas and thoughts come along with that word when ye when you hear it? What does the word Christian really mean? In the original language of Scripture, yay, hath God sent right there, dude, right there. The uh, our dear brother sent this to me, and it's like right there. I read that. It's like done. Okay, you have an agenda. You have an agenda. You're a yay, hath God sent guy. And how do you know if you really are a Christian? <laughs> The first time in history the word Christian was used is found in the book of Acts in chapter 11, verse 26, where it says, The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Prior to this time in the book of Acts, there was no specific name for those who followed Jesus Christ other than believers, followers, and disciples. Oh, it was called the way uh, we are referred to as saints. Okay? Okay? But that's an argument like, um, oh, uh, repentance isn't necessary because it's never mentioned in the book of John. You know there are people out there, especially these antinomianist pukes, uh, especially they like to bring that up. Well, repentance isn't necessary because, you know, it's not mentioned in the book of John. Similarly, being born again. Paul never mentioned it, only Jesus and Peter, so it's for the Jews. No, uh, Paul just defined it. Okay, see? See? See, pre people, see, you, you need to study the scripture. That way, when you read this stuff, you can pick out the heresy and the yea hath God said that this devil is doing. Okay? So, this was the first time in history in Antioch that followers of Christ called Christians. Christ means anointed one. Yes. Yes. What's the name of Christ? Jesus. Which Jesus? And right there, right there, dude. Right, right there. Okay. All right. Going to the Greek. See, if you got to go to the Greek, 
All right. You're, you, what is your standard? You. What Greek was this guy using? Again. The original Greek word for Christian is Christianos, which comes from the two Greek words Christ and Tion. The word Christ means anointed. Yes, it does. And Tion means little. So the word Christian literally means little anointed ones. We, we saw in Scripture, Peter used it in a negative connotation. We never called our... Dude, people, we never called ourselves Christians. Paul knew of it and never used it. Peter knew of it and used it in the context in a negative way. Okay? Called Christians by the world. Okay? Convince, uh, persuade us me to be a Christian. Paul just overlooked it. Worldly. It's a worldly term. Okay? It's a worldly term. So, now, now let's, let's read this. During his life, Jesus was called the Messiah which meant the anointed one. And we are his little anointed ones who have been anointed by his Holy Spirit to represent him in this world. Now, yes. Now, see, the Holy Ghost and the Lord, and I'm sure this dude's a Trinitarian. I'm sure. I'm sure. The anointing, okay, that James chapter, where is that? James chapter 2, no, James chapter 3. James chapter 3. First, I did this, I did this the last time talking to Brother Alexander about this. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Okay? Now, this is where this devil could twist this. Okay? The Holy Ghost is referred to as an anointing. Okay? Yes, it is. Okay, and the Lord is that spirit. First John chapter 2, verse 19 on to verse 20. For they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One. And ye know all things. Verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Now that right there is a reference unto the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that spirit that dwells within the believer. It is the anointing of the Lord himself within you. It is not a special privilege that you are a little God, which is what he is subtly Referring on to. This guy is dangerous. This guy is deadly. Okay? And see, he's using that fancy schmancy going to the Greek. Yea, have God said. Okay? Alright. Yeah, alright. Interestingly, the word Christian is only found three times in the Bible. However, how do you know if you are truly a Christian? I'm not a Christian, thank you very little. I can say I'm a car because I'm in a garage, but that doesn't make it true. Or just because I'm surrounded by a chicken fence, that doesn't mean I'm a chicken. I believe being a Christian is more than just saying a few words, but is rather a changed life and a new way of living life according to Scripture. Changed life. What brings about that changed life? That anointing the Lord Jesus Christ, the permanent indwelling of the Lord, which makes you a new creature. How come he didn't uh, expound on that? Hmm, I wonder. All right. In the New Testament, how we live life is another way of saying how we walk in this world. One way we can tell that we are Christians is by the life that we live, how we walk our life in this world. But see, okay, change life. What brought about that changed life? Huh? Oh, there are so many of these Christians that can have a changed life but are not 
a new creature. See, and this is the trap that so many people, it's like change life. Hey! Hey, this guy's preaching the change life gospel, isn't he? But what brought about that change? Hmm? We are his workmanship, a new creature. God within you, the hope of glory. Funny he's not mentioning that, isn't he? How do you live your life? What is the center of it? What is most important to you? What do you make time for? If you had one, what would be the theme song that describes your life? And with Christianity, I, 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 me, 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 me. <laughs> the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, not using the scripture. The old is gone, the new is here. <laughs> Going to the Greek and not using the scripture. And you're supposed to take this dude seriously. I think perhaps maybe no. Okay? See, brethren, again, the Greek thing. Okay? The original languages. This guy is a Jesuit trained cemeterian. I can guarantee you. They have God said. Oh, first Corinthians uh, second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The new creation has come. No. New creature. There's a difference. Difference, big difference between a new creature and a new creation. The one is the one that brings about the new, the changed life. And see, he's not referencing the scripture which says new creature. This guy is a wicked devil. Smooth, subtle, using everything of the definition of subtle and the variation that we already looked at. You're seeing it. This is, this is what's going on, brethren. This is your Christianity, Christian. Yea, hath God said. This verse means that Christians, that as Christians, we are not who we once were problem with many Christians today is that they are expecting new results by living the old way. When Jesus saved you, he created you to be new for righteousness and holiness. One true test of being a Christian is that we are little anointed ones. This guy's meaning little gods. Wow. By the way we walk and live, Compared by the way that we did before. Oh, like checklist Christians. That's a good one for the description box. Okay. And see, many you can people can bring about a changed life. They can. But what aren't they doing? Philippians chapter, uh, what is that? Philippians chapter 1, brother. Is that Philippians 1 or is that Philippians 2? For to me, or, or where is that? Or, or is that Colossians 1? Uh, or is that Colossians chapter 1? It's Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Okay. What brings about your changed life? Okay? This guy is preaching a changed life, yet absent of being made a new creature. And the verse that mentions new creature, he uses a Bible for. Okay? All right? Oh, let me see. For, uh, verses 18 on to verse 23 in Colossians chapter 2. 
Let no man beguile you of your reward of a, in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. And no marvel! Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And, no, and it's no marvel either that his ministers are transformed. As the ministers of righteousness. The wicked devil. Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Did you go into the original languages and the Greek? Okay. You're your own standard, pal. And not holding the capital H head, who is the head of the body, Christ. This man is a deceiver. From which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Taste not, touch, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Which things have indeed a shoe of wisdom in will worship, worshiping the will, and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor of to the satisfying of the flesh. What does this mean? Meaning that people can have a changed life, but yet not be a new creature. So little anointed ones. Little gods, huh? Yeah. I want to ask you today, how differently do you live now that you are a Christian than you did before? We need to understand, especially in our Western culture, that being a Christian is more than just believing a certain set of beliefs and creeds. Being a Christian is a way of life in which we seek to identify, ident, to, in which we seek to identify as closely as we can with Jesus. Oh, you mean you are as little gods? Huh? Christian means little anointed ones. Why do you think the Lord never referred to us as Christians? Be like Christ. Huh? Sinless? More righteous because you forgive Satan? Being a Christian is a way of life in which we seek to identify as closely as we can with Jesus. Which one? Following Christ is a lifestyle choice. This is true. You, God's not forcing you to walk according to his standards. That is true. But see, what brings about the change of life being made a new creature, which he doesn't even talk about? This is why when you got these guys... Okay, this guy is preaching the changed life gospel. But he's going to the originals and the Greek. He's a deceiver. Subtly preaching. Ye shall be as gods. Ye are gods. Okay? Accepting him as Lord and Savior. Choosing to believe when it seems impossible. Choosing to love those whom you would much rather hate. Ah. And choosing to value God over all other attachments. And right there. Right there. We are to abhor that which is evil. Tie in there for that guy, the Sermon on the Mount. I bet you if you were to ask. I, I forget what this guy. Barry Petit. Barry Petit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, and then he gives the thing about going to his fellas house. Oh, gee, imagine that. So this Barry guy, is a yea hath God said Jesuit trained textual critic going to the originals, preaching the veil, ye shall be as gods, you are little gods, making reference on you, you know, love those who you should, um, Someone is an enemy of our Lord, they are our enemies. We love our enemies by giving them truth. This guy 
is a wicked devil. This guy is a vile, rank, wicked devil. And he's subtle, boy. Oh, he's smooth. He's smooth. He glazes you over with that rhetoric. Okay, Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30. Huh. Ah. See, a saint will make it through this. <laughs> and certain select enemies. Isaiah 30. This is something. To say. Okay, you, you got the gist. The link for this will be in the description box for you to look over if you want. Okay? Isaiah 30. Verses 8. On to verse 11. Now go, write it before them in a, in a table. Note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. And of course, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Best. One of the best. <laughs> Verses 1 on to verse 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. What is the word, Mr. Barry Petit? Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Well, the Greek says this, or the originals. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned on to fables. It's like the antinomian, Christian. Save yourself. You are your own God. You are your own standard. What we looked at today and that, that link, which will be for you in the description box, is a perfect example of all of what we have talked about today. <laughs> that guy, you know, love your enemy. Love him. Love him. Yeah. Granted, if my one enemy who I hate... Uh, other than myself, uh, were dangling off of a cliff, yes, I would help him up, of course. He'd stomp on my feet. He's the same guy who's deceiving some, someone and who deserves to be deceived and who knows better. That's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. I hope you take this to heart. I really do. You need to wake up. Come. Let us reason together. You and I. See. Cheerio. See you later.